right, we are now live. And uh, let's see, watching the participants taken up. So we'll give minute, uh, folks a minute or two to log on. Uh, and then uh, Rachel's going to introduce our speaker today, which we're very excited about. But yeah, let's let let's let host, host, folks uh, log on for a moment. Uh, All right, while we, while we uh, let folks uh, log on for a moment, thanks everyone uh, so far who's joining us. Just to give you a quick reminder, uh, we're going to uh, hear from our, our invited speaker today and then we're gonna do a Q&A at the end and we're gonna use the Q&A feature of the Zoom call. So please type your questions there in the Q&A box and I'll kind of read them out and moderate at the end. Um, you can also use the chat feature, but it's easier to organize the questions using the Q&A. So if we could put stuff there, that would be best. And I'll moderate at the end. And then the last note that I'll say is, uh, if you are a student, put a little asterisk by your question or in parentheses, write student question, because uh, we're going to prioritize those and ask those first. I want to make sure that students get a chance to talk and interact and let their students, uh, let their questions uh, be discussed. Um, so yeah, make sure make sure you note that so I can see that uh, when I'm when I'm reading through the Q and A questions. Um, okay, so uh, today Rachel is going to introduce our our speaker, and maybe we can give another another thirty seconds, Rachel, and then you can uh, start us off. Sounds great. Thank you, Andy. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's nice to see some familiar names in the chat, some people I don't know, some colleagues from sociology. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm excited today to introduce you to Natasha Quadlin, who is an assistant professor of sociology at UCLA. Natasha took a cold email from me and accepted this invitation after last summer, I think I was just reading about um, for one of my own papers and came across like four of her papers in a row. I was like, I need to get her, I need to talk to her. And she was at UCLA. So I thought we might as well invite her down the 405 and she instead is joining us from Zoom. Um, but excited to have you in proximity. Natasha's new to Southern California. She um, recently moved from Ohio. She was on faculty at Ohio State before moving to LA last spring. Um, Natasha's work looks at social inequality in the US with a focus on inequality in the access to and returns to education. So she has a lot of work that overlaps with stuff we're doing in the School of Ed and we're so excited for her to hear her today. So like Andy said, um, feel free to put questions in the Q&A at any point and then at the end we'll have um, a moderated discussion. If you have any clarifying questions um, or need to stop her at any point, um, Put a question in the chat of the Q&A and um, Andy and I will keep an eye on that because um, Natasha won't be able to see those as well. But Natasha, thanks for joining us. We're so happy to have you here and take it away. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. And um, I'm really excited to share this work. It's pretty new as I'll, I'll talk about a couple of times. Um, so this is joint work with um, Jordan Conwell, who's an assistant professor in the sociology department and the School of Education at uh, Wisconsin-Madison, and then also Jaya Wang, who's a graduate student in sociology at Wisconsin. And so when we use, I have this term MRS degrees in quotes, um, or I guess, you know, <laughs> whatever we call the, the single quotes, um, but because we don't use this term MRS degrees, literally. Um, so the MRS degree, for those who aren't familiar or just as a refresher, is kind of a pejorative term to refer to women's practice of looking for a husband in college. This is by and large not the case nowadays, although the term is still prominent in some parts of the country and among some groups. Um, but we use this term MRS degrees because our findings suggest that earlier cohorts of women um, among these earlier cohorts, economic returns to higher education were primarily through marriage. 
However, at the same time, access to marriage varied considerably by both college quality and by race, as we'll be showing in this talk. Um, so we've not written this paper yet, so we would love your suggestions on things to look at and arguments to develop. We're especially interested in hearing from education scholars because we've only presented this work to sociologists so far. Um, so this interdisciplinary audience will be really great to hear from. Okay. So in recent decades, college access and completion um, has varied considerably in the United States, including on the basis of both race and gender. So in terms of race, we've seen increased BA attainment among both Black and Hispanic students. And in terms of gender, we've seen increased BA attainment of women relative to men. This is sometimes referred to as the rise of women in this literature. So this is a figure from a book um, that sociologists will probably be familiar with, but um, it's called The Rise of Women by two sociologists, Tom DeFried and Claudia Buchmann, um, that shows these groups that we're really interested in here. So these are white men, white women, black men, and black women. And so over this time period from 1910, um, for birth years, 1910 through 1980, all of these groups that were interested in increase their educational attainment over this time period. Um, but this especially happened in the last couple of decades or the last couple of decades of birth cohorts. Um, and the slopes, if we look just at, especially at this most recent time period, um, they've been steepest for white women followed by black women. So these are the groups that are increasing the fastest in terms of their college completion. I've highlighted this one period or this one um, piece here because this is the cohort that we're really focused on in this paper. These are folks who were born between around 1955 and 1965. And this is the cohort. This is a, a really special cohort in a lot of ways. Um, but this is where we especially see the reversal of the gender gap in college completion for white men. Um, so notably, although this is referred to as the rise of women or the reversal of the gender gap, it really only occurred among white women in this period. Black women, on the other hand, have been earning more college degrees than black men for much longer, starting with birth cohorts born around 1925. Um, so although we, make, we do make a big deal of this reversal of the gender gap in the 1980s, this was really only the case for white women, um, and black women have basically always had an advantage over black men in terms of their educational attainment. Okay, so what we see in that graph um, is referred to as vertical stratification. So this is the idea that some groups have more education than others. So they might be um, differentiated vertically in terms of the amount of education that they have. But sociologists and education scholars have shown that as vertical stratification increases, horizontal stratification becomes increasingly salient to labor market outcomes. So we're essentially comparing people who have the same level of education um, on that vertical hierarchy, and we're trying to distinguish between them in terms of um, other characteristics. So dimensions of hor horizontal stratification might be differences in the fields of study that they attain or the different types of institutions that they attend. Um, and there are many different examples of horizontal stratification in the literature. Research has really been limited, however, in considering how these dimensions of horizontal stratification vary according to individuals' race and gender. So for example, these would be differences in the types of institutions attended across race and gender groups. We're getting a lot better at looking at those things. We have a lot better data than we used to when it comes to these dimensions of horizontal stratification across race and gender, but this is really a burgeoning area of the literature. Um, and this is really an important consideration um, for us, especially in this paper, because college access and completion have expanded considerably along these same traits, race and gender. So we've started to examine this in some other work. Um, so we have a paper that's forthcoming in a journal, Social, Social Forces, that looks at economic returns to college quality among Black white and Hispanic men and women. So these are essentially six groups that we're looking at. 
Um, the outcome that we look at in this paper is individual income, so not household income, which I'll get to in a second. It's just individual economic returns to higher education. And the data that we use in this paper comes from the NLSY 79 cohort, which we're also using in this current work as well. Um, and we're using data on college quality from the Barron's. This is in the restricted use data set. So they essentially rank all colleges into tiers um, from less competitive through the most competitive schools in the nation. So this figure pretty um, accurately, or it captures essentially what we find for black and white women. Um, and black and white women, we highlight them in this paper because we think they're the most interesting contrast that we find. So for black women on the right, that we have this fairly steady upward trajectory in terms of personal income from the least competitive to the most competitive institutions. So as black women in this cohort attended increasingly more um, competitive institutions, their personal income increased accordingly. But for white women on the left side, this isn't necessarily the case. So white women's personal income tends to increase up to a point. So at, at the point of competitive schools or competitive colleges, this is essentially where they're peaking. But for those who attended the most competitive colleges, their income actually declines across this competitive to very competitive um, across this, this threshold. Um, and th so this surprised us, I will say, um, and we wanted to know what was really going on here with this contrast between black and white women. Um, and we thought it had something to do with marriage and households and the extent to which these women are pooling incomes with partners. Okay, so in this regard, Tom Dupreet and Claudia Buchmann have argued that the benefits of the rise of women have accrued not just to women as individuals, but also to their families and to their households. And this theoretically happens across institutions. So for example, if we look at the labor market, we know that college educated women experience higher labor force participation and wage returns than their peers with less education. Um, and then at the same time, if we look at marriage, we know that college educated women experience high partnership rates and they tend to marry other people who are highly educated. The result of these trends, if we put them all together, is that college educated women are very likely to partner and to have college educated partners, which then leads to the consolidation of educational, financial, and other forms of capital that are being aggregated within households and tend to coalesce. Okay. So these patterns have really been demonstrated for the quantity of women's schooling. Again, this is, this is those dimensions of, horizontal, of vertical stratification or the amount of education that you might have. Um, but we're asking what about the quality of education or what about college quality or college selectivity? These are terms that are often used interchangeably. Um, and these are dimensions of horizontal stratification. So in this regard, there's a lot of research that assesses economic returns to college quality specifically for individual incomes, um, like our study that we discussed a couple slides back. So we know that high college quality is tied to high incomes, especially for men. Um, and we know that there's a little bit of movement for women as we showed earlier, where it's not necessarily a straightforward linear relationship between college quality um, and personal economic returns. Um, but college quality is also highly relevant to the household economic trends that we've been discussing. So research shows that 30% of married college graduates marry someone who attended the same college. I'm always surprised by that statistic because it's huge, 30%. Um, there's also this very strong tradition of marriages within institutional networks. So this phenomenon of Ivy League marriages or Ivy marriages where Ivy Leaguers marry other Ivy Leaguers. Um, so even if um, they're not necessarily marrying somebody who attended the same college, they might be marrying someone who attended a similar college or a college that's in the same tier of college quality. Um, there's also been a few studies that show that women's household economic returns to college quality tend to be higher than men's. 
Um, so if we link all of these issues together, then what we're doing is we're trying to integrate the literatures on household returns to higher education, as well as economic returns to college quality, which would be this horizontal dimension of stratification. So a final component that we're highlighting that has been very much absent from a lot of this literature is this issue of race. So research consistently shows that black women have lower partnership rates than white women, including among the college educated. Um, and what this does is that this ultimately translates to lower rates of dual for black women. Um, although we're not really sure how this tends to break down across different levels of college quality. So we don't know if the same trends that are applying to those who attended, for example, community colleges would be the same for those who attended the most selective institutions. Um, so that's something that we need to investigate. We also tend to draw from um, literature on racial patterns in assortative mating. So we're not trying to be deterministic with this um, because racial rates of intermarriage are, are certainly on the rise, but these are average trends that we're investigating. So overall, when black women are partnered, they are very likely to be partnered with black men. And these black men routinely face discrimination and marginalization in areas like education and the labor market and labor market exclusion due to criminal justice contact and incarceration. The result of all of these things is that black men have fewer opportunities to develop human capital and to garner labor market returns from that human capital. We also find evidence in our social forces paper um, and others have found this too, that these trends also apply to socioeconomically advantaged black men, not just those who are disadvantaged. Um, and these may form part of college, um, these men, these who are socioeconomically advantaged may form part of college educated black women's network of potential partners. Um, so the returns within households clearly um, could vary for, for black women um, as well. So let's put all of this together then and pose our research questions because we're trying to incorporate lots of literatures um, so we can summarize these um, succinctly. So one, what are women's household as opposed to individual economic returns to college quality? And to what extent do these returns vary by race? And here we're, we're focusing specifically on black versus white. To what extent, number two, to what extent do characteristics of women, their partners, if they are partnered, and their families account for any racial differences in such returns? And then three, to what extent have women's household returns to college quality and any racial differences therein changed across birth cohorts? And specifically, we're looking at the NLSY 79 versus the NLSY 97. I haven't really touched on this last piece yet, number three, where we're looking across birth cohorts. I'll explain it when I get there. Um, basically, we're able to look at two cohorts who are pretty much adjacent to each other. And we observed that these patterns that we're finding in terms of um, household um, racial differences and household returns to college quality have changed quite a bit across cohorts in a relatively short period of time. Um, so even though um, there are some patterns that are very consistent between the NLSY 79 and 97, this is one area where we think things have changed very rapidly. Okay. So like I said, our data come from two separate but interrelated data sets. These are the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, 1979 and 1997 cohorts. Those in the 90s, and we'll start with the 79 cohort in this first um, column here. They were born between 1957 and 1964. They turned 35 between 1992 and 2000. This is important, um, the, the age where they turned 35 because we're, we're calculating their earnings at age 35 for most of our analyses. Um, these folks, uh, we refer to them colloquially as trailing edge baby boomers. Um, and again, we're focusing mostly on this cohort in the paper. 
Meanwhile, the 97 cohort, they were born between 1980 and 1984. They then turned 35 in 2014 to 2018. And this is why we look at age 35, because this is essentially the oldest we can look at the 97 cohort um, with the data that we currently have available. Um, we could classify them as early millennials. I know the boundaries between generations are hotly contested, um, but we could maybe call them early millennials. Um, and in both cohorts, you'll see on, in this last row here, we have large samples of both black and white women college attendees, which is really crucial for this study um, and is not the case for every study that's out there. Okay. So let's discuss our measures of college quality. Um, so in the restricted use version of the NLSY data sets, respondents reported the name and location of the colleges they attended. This is really helpful for graduate students who conduct research on higher education. The data are there. It's always nice to know um, which data sets have which variables. So this is one that has full names of colleges if you need them. Um, the data set then has codes for each of these colleges. So what we did is we generated um, what is called a person college record of all colleges that, re that the respondent ever reported attending. So for example, in the NLSY 79 cohort, we have a total of 17,222 valid enrollments that then are linked to 5,772 college goers. Um, the enrollments of course are higher than the college goers because there are some folks who go to more than one college. Some go to much more than one college. So for the analyses that we're doing, the college attended measure is the last college that a woman attended prior to age 35. There are reasons for this. We can discuss them if you'd like. Um, for partnered women, um, what we have is that we have information on their partner's educational attainments. So the level of education that they attained or vertical stratification. We also have a few other characteristics about them but we don't have college quality. This is an important limitation that I'll return to later on, but we only have college quality for the focal or the woman who's in the data set, not necessarily the person that she's partnered with. Okay, so what we do is that we take these college codes and then we construct a college quality index that we borrowed from economists who work in this area. So this index incorporates four key measures. This is the 75th percentile of SAT scores of entering students, the percent of applicants who were rejected from the school, the average salary of all faculty who are engaged in instruction, and then also the undergraduate faculty to student ratio. So we combine all these measures um, to essentially create a continuous measure of latent institutional quality, which is in line with common notions of selectivity or prestige, which are often used um, in other studies um, related to selectivity, college quality, et cetera. Um, most two-year colleges, so we have all this information for four-year colleges, but we also incorporate two-year college goers. Most of those colleges tend not to report this information to iPads for various reasons. Um, they're also generally considered to be in a very different category as two-year colleges when it comes to selectivity or college quality, so we place them in their own category. Okay, so if we put all of those things together then, these are the ultimate categories that we use as college quality. Um, and we end up presenting most of our analyses in four bins, so two year and then different percentiles of selectivity or college quality among four year colleges. Um, so an example of a two year college, if we're just looking at our great state of California, um, a two year college would be Pasadena City College. Um, if we go from the first to 60th percentiles, these, would, um, these schools would range from West Coast University of Los Angeles through Vanguard University of Southern California. If we go up one more bin from the 61st to the 90th percentile, this would be La Sierra University through San Diego State University. And then if we look at just the 91st to 100th percentiles, we would have Poly up through Cal 
um, I'd have to look at the data and go back and see where UC Irvine falls, um, but it would certainly be very, very high, definitely in this top band. UCLA would be there too. Okay. So when we look at the racial differences across college quality bins, this is essentially how this breaks down or how we translate the college quality bins through um, the percentage of black women and white women who are attending these types of colleges. So we see that black women, if we look at this first row, they tend to be overrepresented at two year institutions or community colleges. Um, white women at the same time are overrepresented in the highest quality institutions. These are those at the 91st through 99th percentile of college quality. Both of these patterns are very much consistent with prior research. Um, these proportions, I don't show the numbers here, but they ultimately translate to pretty healthy cell sizes within all of these bands for both white women and black women. So this is re really helpful um, and make sure that we can conduct all the analyses that we want. So let's go to our first research question. Um, so again, this is what are women's household as opposed to individual economic returns to college quality and to what extent do these returns vary by race? Um, black versus white. Um, for the sake of presentation, so just to show how these trends might vary between individual and household income, we're going to start with individual income, then we're going to move to household income, um, and then we will move to women's relative contributions to their households. And these, just to begin with, these are all with the NLSY 79. Okay, so first here is individual income. And so we have two main points of interest that we might want to highlight if we're just looking at individual income. So first, we find relative parity of Black and white women's individual incomes across the range of college quality. So if we're just looking within each of these bins, community colleges, first through 60th, et cetera, et cetera, there are no racial differences within any of these quality bins. Um, second, though, if we look at the point estimates for the highest quality colleges, these are those in the 91st, it's labeled 91st through 100th percentile, um, we see that Black women have about a $5,000 income advantage. The race gap, again, isn't significant at this highest, um, this highest level of college quality in part because the cell sizes for black women among the highest quality colleges is the smallest that we have in this data set. Um, but black women, if we just look at um, the point differentials within this quality bend, um, they have an advantage in, in raw terms. Okay, so we see these individual income returns. Um, and then the question becomes, does this black white parity in individual incomes ultimately translate to parity in terms of household incomes. And this is on the next slide. So clearly this is not the case, um, but let's break this down a little bit to try to figure out what's going on here. So if we look just at black women, so this is the, the lower line down here, um, we see that there tends to be an increase between this two-year, four-year college margin. So if we just look at community colleges, versus the first through 60th percentile on the left side of the figure, there does tend to be a small increase if we're just looking at black women. Um, but otherwise their household incomes are pretty flat across the range of college quality. So regardless of whether women attended the least selective or, or lowest quality four-year colleges versus the highest quality four-year colleges, there isn't a lot of gain that's happening there in terms of household income. This pattern, however, is very different for white women, which is this top line. So their returns tend to be flatter at the lower end. So going from community colleges through the less selective four-year colleges, um, but then they really take off among these higher quality colleges. And as a result of these two trends with black women being pretty flat across this range and white women getting this, this steady advantage, um, the overall result is that the black white gaps in household income increase steeply with college quality. In the highest bin, um, this ultimately translates to about $113,000 for white women per year versus about $58,000 per black women, per black women. And this is a huge difference in, in just raw terms. 
Okay, so finally, it, just to give this initial impression of the NLS Y79, let's look at how much women are contributing to their households in terms of their outside earnings for pay. And that's here. So this is sometimes called the dependency ratio. Uh, we don't like the, the implications of the term dependency ratio. So we're calling this what this is, which is the ratio of individual to household incomes. So what we see here is that black women's share of household income is higher than white women's at each of these levels of college quality. So in fact, black women's shares that they're contributing to the household tend to increase with college quality, um, whereas white women's shares tend to decrease along um, the range of college quality. So at the top level, black women are contributing a median of 71% of household income, as opposed to white women who are contributing only 29% among those who went to the highest quality colleges. Um, this does include unpartnered women, this first, um, this first figure that I'm showing, and I'll get to that in a second. So there are lots of Black women who have a ratio of one in this figure. It also includes women who aren't working. So there are, um, for example, a lot of white women who have this ratio of zero. Um, but clearly, Black women are not receiving household returns to college quality in the way that white women are, at least in this earlier cohort. Okay, so now let's turn to research question two. So to what extent do characteristics of women, their partners, if they are partnered, and then also their families account for any racial differences in these returns that we see? Um, and so let's start here by looking at descriptive characteristics by race. Um, and let's look especially at the colleges that are between the 61st through the 90th percentile. So these are kind of colleges that are in the middle in terms of quality. Um, and we use this bin for illustrative purposes because this is the most common bin for four-year college attendees among both, both black women and white women. So this is kind of the modal range of, um, of quality for, for all the groups that we're studying of those who attended four-year colleges. Okay, so if we just compare the characteristics of white women and black women who attended these colleges, uh, we find that white women tend to complete more years of schooling. Um, and just to, to clarify, this includes people who didn't graduate. And this is why the, the number of years of schooling, even among those who attended a four-year college, is less than 16. If you graduated, you would have had 16 years of schooling. But um, the, even the, the mean among those who attended these colleges um, is less than 16. Um, black women, if we go to the next row, um, they're much more likely to be working full time for the full year. Um, and then among those are working, so we're looking at occupations among those who are working, um, black and white women are equally likely to be working in managerial or professional occupations, but black women at the same time are more concentrated in service occupations. Um, so we have big differences in terms of who is working and then also in terms of the types of jobs that these women have. Um, so we're already seeing big disparities between black women and white women in terms of working and also the quality of their jobs. So next let's look at partner characteristics. Um, we see huge differences in partnership at age 35. 77% um, of white women in this bin of college quality were partnered versus only 42% of black women. Um, white women's partners, if we just look at the characteristics of, of their partners, they're much more likely to have completed college. Um, and then black women's partners are much more likely to not be working. Um, so these are some of the patterns that ultimately translate um, to lower household returns for black women. Um, and although we've pulled out, so here when we're looking at just the 91st or 61st to 90th percentile um, of college quality, we've pulled out these currently partnered statistics for this middle group of college quality. But I also wanna emphasize that these racial groups or these racial um, gaps in partnership status are very much consistent for all levels of college quality. So let's revert and just take a break um, here for a second. Um, and we show that here. So 
the, the 7742 statistic that I showed for the percentage of women who are partnered at each level of college quality, um, this tends to be very consistent across bins. So regardless of college quality, there's this very similar breakdown in terms of partnership rates, which I personally found a bit surprising. And finally, let's look at children. Um, so we have the same exact proportion of these women have children. Um, and there are no significant differences in terms of the number of children. However, white women are much more likely to have a child under the age of three when they're age 35. Um, and what this ultimately means from a practical standpoint is that black women are having children younger than white women. So they end up with the same percentage having children and the same number of children, um, but the, the ages of those children vary considerably. So um, I show these descriptive statistics because we're still trying to figure out the best way to model these findings. Um, I think descriptive statistics tell us a lot in this situation, but of course it's preferable to use formal models to illustrate um, the extent to which these characteristics contribute to racial gaps at different levels of college quality. Our current approach that we're taking um, is to run decompositions within each of these specific bins. Um, so for example, we would take partnered women who are in the lowest bin of college quality, run these decompositions to figure out how much individual characteristics and partner characteristics and child characteristics are contributing to these gaps and then compare them across all of the bins to see um, the extent to which those explained portions are changing. Um, the only real disadvantage to this approach is that we're not able to put partnered and unpartnered women in the same model. We would prefer to do that because it's more parsimonious. Um, but I think what we'll end up doing here is to first run a model that predicts women's chances of partnering um, and to demonstrate racial gaps um, in partnering and then, re, um, and then re run those decompositions by both partnership status and by college quality. Um, that will be a nice way of summarizing these findings that I've shown here with actual models. But if anyone has alternative ways of thinking about this, um, I'd be all ears. And like I said, we're still writing this up. So we're curious as to what is the best way to demonstrate this. Okay. So our final research question is to what extent have women's household returns to college quality and any racial differences therein changed across birth cohorts and we're specifically interested in the NLSY 79 versus the 97. Okay, and so this is where we're focusing on now. So these are the NLSY 97 cohort. They're born between 1980 and 1984. These are the early millennials that I spoke about. Um, and by this time, by the time these folks are going to college, women are now far more likely than men to graduate for college in both of the racial groups that we're studying. So let's start with individual income. These figures aren't perfect yet. The axes don't line up perfectly, but you can still get a pretty clear picture of what's going on here. So by the 97 cohort in this right, this right side panel that I'm showing here, we see that both black and white women receive higher returns to college quality in terms of their individual income. Um, and we also see this continued parity within tiers of college quality. Um, so in other words, for both of these groups, we're seeing this pretty steady linear trend in terms of individual income and college quality, um, which we see as an improvement over the, the 79 results in terms of equity. Um, okay. So how about household income then? <laughs> so these are individual income results, like I said. These figures are a little bit better lined up. Um, and by the, seven, by the 97 cohort, which again is in the right panel, we see a lot of change that's already happened. So we see greater black white parity in women's household incomes. Um, this is driven particularly by higher household income returns for black women in these top two bins. So just among the 61st and 90th, and especially with the 91st to 100th percentiles, black women are much closer to white women in terms of their household earnings. Um, in the 97 cohort, it, or sorry, it's it's hard to switch between 97 and 79. <laughs> with the 79 cohort on the left side, 
the largest black white difference here was among those who attended the highest quality colleges. So this is the left bin, but the, the right, the furthest right bin. But by the 97 cohort, this is on the right side, this is the smallest difference. So the smallest difference is among those who attended the highest quality colleges. And this contrast, in fact, isn't statistically significant. So we ultimately see this as a reshuffling in terms of where the inequality is happening at a given point in time. So in the earlier cohort, the most apparent contrast is between race groups. Black women are experiencing um, significant disparities across this entire range of college quality. In the later cohort, however, we see distinct inequality within race groups. There's still certainly inequality between race groups still or be between black women and white women. Um, but now there's more of a distinct dividing line between those who attended the highest quality colleges and all others. So it's kind of a, a, a co or a, um, a, we're concentrating advantage among those who attended the highest quality colleges. Okay, so finally, let's look at the individual to household um, income ratios for these women in the 97 cohort. And much has changed here too. Um, so across the distribution of college quality, white women have become responsible for higher shares of household income just among white women, but black women at the same time have become responsible for lower household income shares. Um, so as a result, um, we see much smaller differences in these ratios over time. Um, all of these contrasts in the 97 cohort are significant, um, but in the 97 cohort, this is only significant at the community college level. Um, so all of the other contrasts um, in terms of contributions to household income are very similar for white and black women, regardless of their college quality. We expect that this is happening because white women are working more consistently, um, while black women are tend to be getting more from their partners. Um, we haven't done a super deep dive into this yet, but I'm, I'm interested in any um, ideas or suggestions that you have um, to investigate these changes over time, because it is difficult to capture um, with the data that we have and the types of models that we're trying to run. So we'd love your suggestions here too. Okay, so let's recap the findings before getting into Q&A. Um, so in summary, the relationship between women's educational upgrading and household economic benefits has been substantially stratified by race. And um, we also show that this has also been true within tiers of college quality or college selectivity. In the cohort that saw the rise of women, this is the MLSY 79, these disparities often increased with women's college quality. So among those who attended more selective colleges, there were even larger racial gaps in terms of both income or individual and household income. In later cohorts, however, both groups experienced higher individual income returns to college quality. And these racial disparities that we observed were much smaller, especially among those who attended the highest quality colleges. So we might characterize this as a shift in the location of inequality, like I mentioned before, um, from between race groups or between black and white to within race groups, comparing those who attended the highest quality colleges versus all others. So this is um, kind of a change in the dynamic or the character of inequality that we're seeing in these different cohorts. And one key limitation, I mentioned this before, but I just wanna emphasize it again, is that we have this limited information on women's partners, including both race and college quality. We're ultimately making educated guesses about partnership and who is partnering with whom based on these known demographic trends. So we're able to do this fairly well, but we ultimately don't know these important characteristics. Um, but with these limitations in mind, we're still very much interested in hearing your thoughts and questions about how we might continue to push this work. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to those thoughts. All right. Thank you, Natasha. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, so let's take a minute now for the audience to kind of gather your thoughts. And again, please place your questions in the Q&A feature and I'll read through them and uh, moderate a bit of discussion. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, okay, we'll give you all a minute to, to think about questions. Can I ask one while people are <clears throat> collecting their thoughts? Cool. Thanks. That was super interesting. And there are a lot of, um, you thought about this in ways that I haven't. I especially like that um, ratio of contribution to household income. I thought that was super interesting. So I'm thinking about um, between these two, two cohorts, for sure, there was a big change in um, the selection into college, right? The like percent of the population um, that attended college. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts on kind of bigger picture framing for this, right? Because uh, within college of those people who go to college, the differences were really stark and super interesting in the trends. But what about um, the margin of selection into college? Yeah. And that kind of makes me think that we should expand this to include those who didn't go to college at all, right? Um, that the, the types of students who are selecting into college would, well, it would broaden across the, the 79 to 97 cohorts. One reason we, we think it's a, a fairly good comparison between the two cohorts because um, by the time the 79 were going to college, we see this, these big rises or these um, big increases in affirmative action. We see the rise of women that's happening. So there is at least the beginning um, of these um, big pushes for college attendance and completion, um, but they're not exactly comparable in those ways. And so um, I, I think like uh, some, yeah, that that's another difficulty in trying to to compare the two cohorts because um, <laughs> looking at um, at just the descriptive statistics among the 79 versus the 97 um, gets really tricky in terms of, um, of, of who's the number, like the percentage of, of folks um, who are selecting into college and not, um, but also the characteristics of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. they're okay, um, but they're, they are very different, as you noted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that um, obviously has implications for, as you talked about, horizontal stratification, right, is the massive move into college, and what do we see about who's going where, which is interesting. I think one totally random comment is, um, your graphs are beautiful. I thought they were so easy to interpret and so nicely, um, so clear, each of them, so well okay. done on the visuals. It was really easy to follow all that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, that was beaten into me over time. <laughs> Uh, I had a similar question about uh, the uh, black versus white uh, access to college question. Was that, um, were you comparing them in proportion to their representation in, like in the United States or just raw numbers? No, so when I showed the, um, the, the graph, the table showing like this is the, the number or the percentage of, of folks in each bin, that's yeah. just within the sample. Um, so yeah. it's still national, you know, it's nationally representative. So the, the hope is that um, they're pretty comparable in terms of uh, the numbers, um, you know, among college goers, this would be the percentage of um, black women who attended each of these types of colleges, for example. Um, but um, yeah, they're, they're quoted from the sample, not from, from national statistics. Right. So, and then that, in that case, if black and white women were equally represented in universities, that would be that black women are overrepresented compared, right? Because there's a lot more white women than black women in our country. Is that right? Um, right. So the so yeah. So there, it ultimately translates to very different cell sizes. So um, even if like we have, um, I don't have, I won't pull this slide up, but um, you know, if 20% of black women are attending the highest quality colleges. Um, that still ultimately translates to a much smaller or a much smaller number of black women who are attending those colleges versus white women. Um, but even even still, the the percentages are not comparable either. White women are still overrepresented in the most elite colleges versus black women, um, and so there's um, 
a percentage disparity that becomes even larger when we just look at raw numbers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. That yeah. Um, okay, we have a question here uh, from Suzanne. Uh, she says, can you talk more about what your results look like within categories of partnership, non-partnered women's returns, uh, time trends versus partnered women's returns, time trends? I'm not sure what you mean by time trends. Um, so you can um, either uh, let me know and uh, uh, or type it or, or unmute or whatever. Um, but in terms of just the returns, so if we look, I, I show the results with partnered and unpartnered women together in the same graph. Um, but if we look at just partnered women um, or if we limit the sample to just partnered women, then a lot of the, the same dynamics end up happening. So the um, two different waves, oh, seven, oh, 79 versus 97. Um, oh, and how they're changing over time. Right. Okay. Um, yes. A lot of it is, is, is very similar. So, um, the, the, um, let me think the partnered women's, um, or like the, yeah, if we just look at the trends, um, regardless of whether they're partnered or unpartnered, a lot of the same dynamics end up happening. Um, and so it's not necessarily just that there's different selection into partnering, um, but even um, net of those differences in partnering, they're very, um, they're very consistent, which, you know, was, was surprising, but also perhaps not surprising to us. Do, uh, I know th this is not in your data, but I'm just curious, do you have any sense or is there any other data on Latina uh, women in college? Do you think it's... Uh, I guess yeah, it's, it's difficult the, the way that um, it's reported. I think we ended up, um, so the, the earlier paper that we had was with both black and they're, they're called Hispanic and in the NLSY um, and then, and white women. Um, and the, the contrast between black and white women tends to be the greatest, um, but there's also um, disparities between um, white and Hispanic women as well. There's, I believe that, and I don't wanna, there's so many findings that I don't wanna misquote the finding, um, but I believe that there are um, pretty big advantages for Hispanic women in terms of community college returns. Um, and that tends to be where a lot of those enrollments were clustering as well. So um, there does seem to be an advantage there, but um, across the, the range of college quality, the disparities tend to be greatest among black and white women. Got it. And I see uh, Wesley has a question in the chat a clarification question about uh, college, uh, college selectivity. Um, was it mentioned, uh, was it measured using Barron's classification? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, well, no, the first paper that we did was with the Barron's um, and in the set in, in this paper that I've presented, I don't think we actually end up using the Barron's. We take all of those iPad statistics um, and then we, we wanted to essentially put them on this continuous measure of college quality instead of the bins, which Barron's gives you. Um, and so we're using, I talked about like the, um, the, the median SAT score, the, um, the percentage of, of folks who are rejected from the university. Um, and we take those indicators um, to, um, to figure out where these, these folks break out in terms of their continuous measure of college quality. But if we just compare the bins or the, um, the bins that we've created versus the Barron's categories, they end up being really comparable. Um, so we didn't have to do it necessarily. <laughs> I see this, um, there's one, uh, there's a couple questions in the chat. Is that okay if I read them? Or yeah, sure. Okay. Um, happy International Women's Day. <laughs> there you go. Um, and yeah, so 
this is the question is about um, black women who are partnering with white men and if the sample size would be too low. And I think that the sample size would be pretty small, but um, that's the unfortunate consequence of not having the data for partners race. Um, so we don't have the partners race and we don't have partners um, college quality. And so we're able to make inferences about who's marrying whom based on those known patterns of assortative mating by college quality and by race. Um, but we ultimately don't know the answers to those questions. Um, but um, that might be something that we would want to look at with other data sets just to get a sense of, you know, if there's a big enough bin in, a, in another data set, but then also trying to see if we can at least, you know, figure out um, um, how those partnerships are playing out in terms of household income. And also their, uh, their educational sort of mating um, might be different. So I would just want to see, um, see what's going on there. Um, the other question is about trends for Asian American women, which I also don't have. <laughs> I'm sorry to say um, the the representation, uh, especially in the earlier cohorts, was much better for for I mean white women especially, um, but we're missing a lot of representation in terms of Hispanic women and, and Asian women too. Yeah. Okay. Another the next question is by Faith. Uh, she says, do you have any idea what drove the divergence in outcomes between the 79 and the 97 in the highest uh, percentile on the individual income graphs? It looks like black women went from 40 to 50, but white women went from 35 to nearly 60. Right. Yeah, that's one of the big contrasts that we're really interested in and which we think is is pretty crazy. Like I personally was very surprised at that drop off in the NLSY 79 where the women who attended the highest quality colleges weren't earning very much. Um, and we think that this has a lot to do with labor force participation patterns. Um, so there were a lot of women, and this is this was kind of the impetus for this paper. There were a lot of white women who attended these highest quality colleges who either opted out of the labor force, so they, they weren't working, um, they were caring for children and other family members, um, or they were volunteering, or they were working part-time, or they were otherwise doing jobs um, that you know, weren't lucrative and weren't, um, they weren't taking up, they weren't full-time jobs. Um, and that dynamic has changed so dramatically from the NLSY 79 to the 97 um, among white women in particular. So we think that this is being driven by labor force participation. Um, and of course, you know, women's, uh, women are, are earning lots of master's degrees. They're you know, going for, for education beyond what they're, they're earning at the bachelor's level. So even in just this short time from like one cohort to the next, um, we think that this is kind of enormous growth or enormous, um, more enormous differences between those two cohorts. Okay, we have a question from Cassandra who says, well, first, thank you for the presentation. And uh, she's wondering how partnering is being defined in this study. Uh, was, uh, she was wondering if private for-profit two-year colleges are a potential area of interest to study or if they were included in the community college category. Yeah, great question too. Um, and no, I, I didn't talk about the definition of partnering, but we're defining this as either cohabiting um, or marriage um, by age. So we're measuring it at age 35 also. So um, there might be some folks who are divorced um, or widowed by this time. Um, but for most, this is married, but there's cohabiting as well. Um, and um, right, the private for profit two year colleges. Um, yes, very big um, interest area and um, super interesting in terms of, of economic returns. These data aren't awesome for that question only because, especially in the 79 cohort, this is um, not really something that, that really emerged or a sector of higher education that emerged until, until after. Um, and among the 97, there's some folks who went to for-profit colleges. Um, and we do have data on them. And we haven't broken them out, um, but we could 
um, we could see, especially because there do tend to be racial disparities in terms of who's attending those colleges and then um, who is experiencing those potentially suppressed labor market returns um, from attending those colleges. Um, so that's a great point. Um, and um, that dimension um, would be a way to, I think, add more nuance to um, selectivity within two-year colleges in particular. Um, so that would be something that we would want to look at, but we haven't. Thank you. All right, we have uh, just under a minute left. So just want to take a moment to say thank you so much, Natasha, for joining us and sharing yeah. fabulous research. It was really interesting. And uh, thank you to uh, the engagement from the audience. Um, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, you're not too far road, maybe down the, down the line, we can get you here actually in person instead of over, uh, over Zoom. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing your time. Yeah, I'm off. Uh my mom lived, I told Rachel that my mom lives in Laguna Woods Village, the old people um, neighborhood. So <laughs> I'm there often. So um, good for you guys for having that nice place to live. So thank you very much all. And um, I appreciate your feedback. And if anyone has additional questions or comments, please email me. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Natasha. That was great. Bye, everybody. Really nice work. Thank you.